Something's going to happen. Something wonderful. G'day fans and welcome to another exciting episode of the show. Three people have joined in the space of the time it took Jeffro to do this. <laughs> Absolutely impressive. Good old Ange has joined us already. Absolutely magnificent. As has Michelle. People are rolling in like oranges. Six people already. I can't believe it. It's a Wednesday night. It's wet. You don't have a curfew anymore. You can go out and about, kitties, within your five-kilometer radius. But instead, you've decided to stick it here with us. How good is that? Now, before I get uh, too excited, and yeah, as you can see, I am excited, I've got to introduce my lads. So, lads, how are we tonight? Uh, most excellent. So, uh, I'm enjoying a change of scenery from where I usually sort of have to film. So, I'm back in the uh, the Jeffro room. So, hopefully, the internet will hold out. Looking forward to uh, seeing how it all goes. Very good. And and I'm a little bit chafed. I'm a little bit chafed because the elastic that's attached to me that only lets me go 5Ks has been strung a little too tightly so um that's why i'm here tonight so this is um something we we're going to discuss two weeks ago but we ran out of time so we've carried it over today it's all about uh it's a little bit more involved than what we've just had um um what appeal what is it about science fiction movies that appeals to us and this was an, actually an idea from michelle a few weeks ago when she sent me through a note and uh was intrigued to sort of have this discussion about because science fiction movies, we're talking specifically sci-fi here, have to create all their own environments primarily from scratch. So we're talking about ones out in space and different planets and whatever else. Everything has to be created from scratch. So it's not like a contemporary movie where a police show set in Chicago is identical to a police show set in New York. They're wearing the same outfits. Yeah, they're still the cars are the same. The buildings are the same. The world is the same. We're talking about completely out in the um, uh, in the foreign um, environments, which all have to be created. And what is it? about the things that we all enjoy, not just us three, but people who are reading this uh, or watching this now. What is it about those products that appeal to us? What makes one different to another? Um, because it's one of those things where you can say, well, okay, if you have a favorite movie, why do you have a favorite movie? What is it that makes it work? And taking that a different, a step further, what if the things that you enjoyed were different? were changed somehow. They weren't you know, a different actor, a different actress, a different location, a different spaceship, a different sound effect, different music. What is it about that, that sort of makes you work? And I was actually quite in, uh, impressed by what Michelle had brought up. So I wanted to ask, and I'll start with Jeffro actually first, because you know, this is more than just saying, oh, I liked it because it was like a good story. I mean, a story is one thing, but it's got to be more to it because a science fiction movie has a lot more visually inf um, intriguing information that goes with it. So, Jeffro, the first question I've got to ask you is why is it, and I'm not being, I'm being quite serious, I'm not being like facetious or sarcastic, Buckaroo Bonsai. What is it about Buckaroo Bonsai that appeals to you? Well, initially it, it didn't appeal to me, but uh, there was a, uh, a person I was really fond of that was a big fan of Buckaroo Bonsai, so I got into it through her. So uh, it just was one of those movies where it just didn't make any impact because it was too um it was just too weird i mean the whole process of having these guys that dress up in these different kind of weird costumes and they're fighting um aliens that you can't really sort of see what they look like because they look like humans and then they flash back to scenes and you do see what they look like uh weirdness like there's a um, classic example of there's a, a chase and suddenly the chase stops and someone says, what's that watermelon doing there? And it's like, I'll tell you later on. Um, it's just for a lot of the mainstream type of people, it just, it was too much to sort of get around. It's too confusing. It just leaps straight into the, uh, the whole story. So you really do have to sort of, uh, not rely on being spoon fed because a lot of that information you either just don't get to hear about or if you really want to delve into it it's it's in the book but um i mean it is your typical sort of cult movie in so much as that uh, whenever you think um cult movies like uh rocky horror picture show um things like um uh even sort of robot monster or, or something like that that it just 
doesn't fit the normal sort of uh, typical story that you would see. And and I think for a lot of people, the fact that uh, uh, it's got a lot of uh, snappy lines to it, uh, the characters uh, are really interesting, and the fact that other people don't get it is a really good uh, desire. The fact you get it means that you, you feel very sort of... Uh, uh, I was going to say smug, but you you, f you, f you feel sort of uh, empowered that, you know, you've found something that nobody else does. And, I mean, for a lot of cult movies, that's what it's all about, you know. So whether it be Blues Brothers or Rocky Horror or um, sort of more obscure sort of cult movies, it's like you get it, the rest of the people don't. So, uh, you know, good on us. Yeah, I'm not sure if we're sort of tackling what Michelle was asking. But hopefully, Michelle, we kind of are, um, because it's obviously one of the things that has a bit of a psychological uh, evaluation associated with it. So we'll sort of try and get it as close as we can. But I do I agree with Jeffro's suggestion that sometimes you can like something because nobody else does. And I think that's actually quite important. Um, I think it's one of those things sometimes when you watch a film and you think, I'm going to love this, and you hate it, and you think, well, everybody else likes it. Why am I different? And sometimes it's because um, it's just not working for you but you don't always know why um mps so uh it, what it, pick a film a sci-fi movie or something that you really really like and try and explain to me what is it about it that uh, appeals to you yeah it's a bit of a tricky one i could I picked several that i could talk about uh i'm not going to pick batman because it's just i'm a batman fan and you know that's just too easy uh there are things i don't like about the film franchise but there are things i love about it uh, so I'm going to go with Star Wars. I'm not going to go with just Star Wars. I'm going to go with the original trilogy because I I love the fact that the good guys won, you know, in the first film. I didn't like the fact that they'd lost in Empire, and I loved the fact that they, they, they won in Jedi. But as a kid, to me, that was all that sort of mattered. You know, you, you still had your witty lines, and you had your, your scariness of Vader turning up and just being in places, you know, Dagobah with Luke in his, in his mind and... Um, the first scene you see with him, you know, strangling the guys on the on the Tanity Four, all that sort of thing. Um, but to have the little people win, you know, back in Jedi, you know, and I mean the David and Goliath story with the Ewoks. Um, for me, they were real creatures back then because you know I was when did that come out? Eighty three. I was nine, so they were still in that realm of possibility. You know, it wasn't like, oh, it was some guy in a suit or some kid in a suit or something like that. These were real, real people uh, on the screen. This was not a, um, a, a thing that was sort of made up in my head. So for me, I think it was the reality of what it was, you know, what it could have been or what it could still be, you know, uh, more than anything else. And as I got older, it became just a really great story, you know, which I love a good, good story. Um, as I got older again, I started making films. It became about the storytelling and how films work and all that sort of stuff. And then I started appreciating why Empire was such a good film. You know, it wasn't the fact that the, the bad guys won. I was like, hang on a second, you've got a three story structure, you've got three, this, three of that, blah, blah, blah. And it changed. It wasn't just a predictable story, you know, and that's what I think made that series. Um, so much more for me over the years. So take that a step further, and I don't want to just focus on Star Wars, but what about Star Wars rip-off rip -off movies, right? Did they have the same impact? Now, whether you saw them or not, I'm not entirely sure, but what about ones that are clearly inspired by? Did they work on the same so, level? So Spaceballs I never saw as a kid because that was a clear Star Wars rip-off, and for whatever reason, I didn't, I didn't see it. Um, what were the others? Were there others? Yeah, there, there was were, a lot of Italian ones that came out at the time. There were Italian ones, yeah. uh, Japanese one called Message from Space, which uh, supposedly sort of was created before um, Star Wars, but yeah. uh, certainly Star Crash and all those other ones. Yep, even Battlestar, you could argue. Um, yeah, so oh, look, I, I, loved, I loved Battlestar, and I don't know what it was about Battlestar because I was way too young. Um, I certainly know I, I love the, the Vipers um, and... You know, the good guys were sort of winning. The bad guys were chasing. There was that. I think it was that that fear of the of the possible. Um, because even with Galactica eighty, when they landed on Earth, you went, "Well, hang on a second. In my tiny little childlike brain, it was like they could turn up here, and we could have Cylons, and that's it. We're doomed." You know, what was really funny was was I watched 
you know, loved Star Wars and there was Superman. And who, which villain was I more afraid of, Vader or General Zod? And it was actually General Zod. And the reason being was not because he was tough or anything like that. It was that he made Superman kneel and he was on Earth. And that's what set in my head as a reality. So I think it's the reality base of these films. I can I can go with the far-fetched stuff, you know, and all that sort of stuff. But um, the reality that something comes to Earth eventually or possibly. Because um, here's an interesting sort of um, one that I wanted to bring up. Now, I'm of the opinion that the first 10 minutes of a movie is what sells it, right? If you're not hooked within the first 10 minutes, 20 minutes, you're gone. You, you've got to get sucked in, right? It, it's It's critical because that then determines whether you're going to invest yourself in the rest of it. I don't think there's very many examples where a movie starts badly and then gets really good as it goes along. And, and I see that a lot, even with big budget films, right? You can have, I mean, I mean, from a psychological point of view, not because it looks pretty or it's a big explosion, just something about it. You, go, you know what? I'm invested in it. It's working for me. And then you're good to go from there on. Um, there's an example of a film that came out uh, I don't know if either of you have seen it. Uh, it's called Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets, right? Ah, yeah, yeah. Made John. by Luke, Luke Besson, right? The guy Besson. who made The Fifth Element. Spent years and years and years putting this thing together and visually, especially, I think it's the planet Muel or Muel, what, the, 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 uh, the Maldives kind of planet, if you will. Visually, it's outstanding. When you see the trailer, it's like, oh, my God, this film is just like, Stunning because they uh, Luke Besson, Besson did um, Fifth Element. You think it's got to be on the same vein as that, right? Now, you would think, based on that, just based on the purely on the visuals and the style and the look and all the rest of it, it was absolutely stunning color and clarity was be awesome in 4K. The film was shit house, right? It putting it simply, it was absolutely crap. It had a crap story and it had appallingly bad acting from the main leads. It was so miscast it wasn't funny. Now, Jeffrey, do you agree with me on that one? Yeah, I mean, I absolutely do. I mean, it, visually, it was a, a treat. Um, it was based on a uh, French comic, of all yeah. things. And yeah. the fact that nobody knew about the comic sort of must have said something about the marketability no, of the movie. The story was good enough, strong enough on its own, but the film was terrible. And that was an example where something where something that can look so pretty and still not work, okay? And yeah. it's had elements that work, but the casting, as I said, was horrendous and um, and the storyline in the end, it just failed. And, of course, in reality, failed badly in critical um, was it financial failure and whatever else. So then you ask yourself, well, what are the movies that do work and think about why they work? What is it about them that actually, like, connects? Now, with The Fifth Element as an example, um, you could easily argue that it's like people like Bruce Willis, uh, his character and Lilu because their chemistry is so good together. But I would argue that people are invested in the movie before they even get to that sequence where they get introduced. I'm talking about the stuff in Egypt, for example, and, and, and the whole lead into that and just the world building. And I would actually argue that the film worked because the production values, it was so different. It was just something you had not not seen before. It was mm -hmm. unique. It was completely out there. The characters of, I think it's pronounced Mondo Shawns, the guys at the very start with the huge bulky bodies and the heads that were moving around, not slick, not fast, completely inappropriately designed, but that is what made it work. And I think as the film progressed, people realised, hey, this is something really different, really unique, and then everything just fell together uh, and uh, made the movie as memorable as it was. And then once Lilu and that came into it, then they, people completely sold. I agree with what... Um, Claire said earlier about the flying taxis and the whole look of the, the city. Everything's sort of all flying around. It's just completely, like, built up to the max. So I think that has something to do with it as well. But I would argue that just the production design alone and the concept is what made the film um, uh, sell. Either of you, I've got to read a comment from Michelle in a sec, which is a really long one. So either of you two want to say anything just while yeah, I move on? I, mean, I, I think sort of if you've got a fairly unique-looking character, uh, then it does attract the uh, the people's uh, interest. And the classic case in point is the uh, 77 movie Star Wars. So many people fondly remember that brief uh, scene in the cantina with all those fantastic aliens. So, you know, if you've got something like that, people are going to love it. And the other thing in terms of weird characters and all that, uh, Dark Crystal. So, you know, it's just people haven't seen it before and they just love something that hasn't been recycled. Well, the interesting thing about Dark Crystal, it's the only, if I can think of, live-action movie that has no human beings in it whatsoever. And for those who are going to be watching this later on, 
Uh, it was just the comments. And I agree with you, Jeff Rowe, that the Cantina aliens would have sold a lot of people on Star Wars, but I'll get to Star Wars in a second. Um, and I agree with you, uh, Michelle, that um, uh, there's a lot of things that sort of work with people on a subconscious level regarding sci-fi as to what they like. Because you remember, if you look at five movies and they've all got different designed spaceships, you go, well, I really love that one. It's like, well, why do you love that one? Is it the shape? Is it the color? Is it the jets? Is it the sound? Well, no sound. Um, these are these things that sort of work on those uh, values. The same with like costumes and the world building and all the rest of it. Um, with Star Wars, uh, just quickly, I think one of the reasons why the film was so successful is because of the used look. Everything was busted. Everything was dirty. Everything was filthy. Traditionally, everything used to be clean and shiny and brand new. And then here comes a story where everything is like in completely run down condition. And I think subconsciously, a lot of people say, you know what? That looks true to life, even though we're in a completely different universe. And uh, I think had everything been squeaky clean from the outset, people just wouldn't have bought it. They just would have gone, you know, something about it looks artificial. And I think that's one of the reasons why I asked you earlier, MPS, why some of the reasons why the, the rip-off movies didn't work, because they had a tendency of making everything look brand new, because it was just easier. It's brand new, make it shiny, we're good to go. Whereas George Lucas made a point of saying, no, everything has to be used and abused and busted and crapped up. And I think that helped, helped a lot. Um, that was very much a uh, key factor because they had a, a British production um, uh, yep. team working on it. So they were used to sort of doing those kind of props, especially if you look at the Jerry Anderson stuff. Yeah, exactly right. Um, Daniel's an interesting one here. Last Starfighter was an interesting one. The world building, I think Starfighter sort of worked in its own way because of its visuals, because they were so unique and so different. I think if you had taken the visual effects out, the digital effects, or not made them digital at all, I don't think the film would have been as successful. It was very groundbreaking in that regard, and I think a lot of people dialed into it because of that way. But I do agree with you that it does make you, I'll get to you in a second, MPS, make you feel as though anybody could be Alex Rogan. So, yeah, it's a fair call. Yep, MPS? Well, that's what I was going to say, because back back then when it came out, pinball machines and Space Invader machines were all pretty popular. You know, that was your fix of getting, you know, your gaming sort of thing. And, you know, the hope that you want to be or that you get the highest score was always there, but the hope that, and the thought that you get the high score and you go into space to fly for a real thing was improbable, but probably in the back of your mind, there's that, that, that inkling that it could actually occur, which makes it far more, again, plausible to, to what could happen, you know? Um, I'm just going to go wind back here. Paul uh, Anderson mentioned Master of the Universe. A lot of people can't stand Master of the Universe. For me personally, Skeletal sold me just straight away. Here's look. Bang, done. Um, that's what I'm invested in. Now, if you had have changed Skeletor's look, made him completely different, wouldn't have worked. I wouldn't give a rat's ass about the movie, but I absolutely adore the film because of one character. And there's actually a number of examples of films where one character can sell the entire thing. And the one that I'm thinking of off the top of my head was Escape from New York. The whole thing hinges on Kurt Russell playing Snake Plissken, right? Take him out or change him, it doesn't work, right? One character holds everything together. And, uh, and even though the look of New York is really interesting with all being run down and isolated and all the, and the set at night time and whatever else, I think that has a lot to do with it. And uh, a lot of people would say, well, there's things I like about it, but it's because of him that is that sells the production mm -hmm. and the film, whether people are all consciously aware of it um, or not. So if we didn't have the perfect casting for any of these films, and this is a, a question which goes a little bit into the TV series, we look at Stargate and you had James Spader playing the role and then the TV series didn't have James Spader but it had, you know, um, yeah. the other sort of guys. They still made it theirs. Can you... See, I love the film, Stargate. I think it's a fantastic film with lots of awesome elements. I didn't watch the series religiously, but I still would watch the series. But in my head, it was sort of like, can I... Can I juggle the fact that this was James Spader back in the day and, you know, now you've got the other guy in there playing the character? Um, I think Victor... So I think Victor balances, sorry. I was going to say, sorry, yeah. a balance of the kind of it's weird at the same time. Yeah, I think people can accept the TV series being different um, and they just adapt. And, and what happens then is when people say, oh, I love a TV... I don't want to get into TV shows because that's another field altogether. But what can happen is people love TV shows that much that they can't watch the movie again because the character that they've now become so connected with in the tv show they see it in the film and go oh no i can't handle james spader being whatever the guy's character's name was it doesn't work for me anymore he's the foreigner he's the outcast even though he started first and the best example of that on a completely different tangent is mash the tv series mash all the cast 
were completely different bar Gary Berghoff, who played Radar. Now, you're used to seeing Hawkeye and Trapper and all those guys being played by Alan Alder and all that. You can't even begin to imagine anybody else playing them. But in the movie, yeah. that was the case. And a lot of people can't watch the movie because they're just so invested in the TV show. But I'll, I don't want to get into those. I'll give you another example. If you ever saw the television show Alienation, you yeah. can't really go back and watch the James Caan movie because the, the TV show is just it. Yeah, exactly right. So, um, but yeah, TV shows are another thing altogether. Um, I would just want to bring a couple of other examples. I think one of the reasons why, and there's some really good comments here, and I'll get to those in a minute, minute why Blade Runner works, right? It's not because of Harrison Ford. It's not because of the replicants. It's the look of the city at night, in the rain, all the lighting. That alone sells it, right? From the very moment you see it, you go, wow. That is grouse. Now, you got to remember, you got to put yourself into the mindset of the era that we're talking about. So you can't say, oh, I saw a movie last week that looked exactly the same. We're talking about when we first see these things. So 1981 or 82, I think, when it came out, it was like, like something we'd never seen before. And I think a lot of people got invested in Blade Runner for those who could see past some of the story issues uh, purely because of the way it looked. And for that reason, it was a huge success because people just dialed into its atmosphere and it's almost like its story and its characters were secondary to that and i think that has a lot to do with the movie's success which is one of the reasons why 2049 probably didn't do as well uh with regarding that do you guys i know this is probably more of a jeffro question because you, you, you've seen blade runner haven't you mps i have it was it was years ago for the i saw it for the first time in about 2002. all right cool so either of you two sort of acknowledge that or agree with that I mean, I'm not really a, a Blade Runner fan, but when I, I saw it on the big screen only a couple of years ago, just before 2049 uh, came up, but, yeah, I mean, it is a very sort of bang. It's like the Tanty 4 for uh, Star Wars. It's like sort of you just go, wow, that that's visually so stunning. Nobody's done that before. Yep, and I think that has a lot to do with it. Um, both Spankin and Kelvin, excuse me, have mentioned Tron. I think... What clearly works for those two productions is the digital world, right? And once again, it's something you'd never, ever seen before. But it wasn't just the way the digital world was created. It was the how the characters uh, interacted with it, the speed of everything. Once you had the tanks and the light cycles and the recognisers, it just brought it all to, to a new reality. And it's like this: things can work well when it's something you've never seen before. But when it's done really, really well, as they did in Tron and the original Tron, and I remember seeing that in the cinema thing, and this just might blow my mind. I've never seen anything like this. And it looked grouse. It wasn't just the fact that it was different. It looked fantastic. And I think that has a lot to do with making something succeed, even if the story is weak in some areas. Uh, and I think a lot of people would argue that you can think of certain movies, you go, what is it about this film that I remember the most? Is it this? Is it the music? Is it the costume? Is it this, this? There's always one thing, typically, and I'm talking, that's why Blade Runner came up with the atmosphere. Uh, and Tron comes up with the, with, the, with the way the digital world looked. If it had been done differently or didn't exist at all in the film, I reckon the whole thing would have just tanked completely because it was missing that massive hook. Um, there you go. Um, a couple of other examples that I just wanted to bring up just quickly. Uh, I personally, this is my personal views, one of the reasons why I think Avatar was such a massive success was Pandora, the way Pandora was um, portrayed, the colour mm -hmm. of the world, the environment, the fact that it was so different. Add on top of that, the culture of the Na'vi, okay, who they were, the way they acted. Because you've got to remember, the Avatar story is pretty straightforward. It's not like it's, oh, wow, we're talking about a story that's so unique and so different that uh, it's just heading into brand new territory. For the most part, it was all just, you know, colour by numbers. But the look of the film and the way it was presented, um, I think, uh, is what made it such a huge success because people were saying you've got to see the colour and the design and the way everything is portrayed uh, visually. It's It's... Striking. It's effectively what Valerian should have been uh, at the top here, Valerian from Luke Besson, but it wasn't. And um, Avatar, by a long way, was actually far, far superior. And I think that is one of the reasons. I mean, a lot of people are critical of Avatar, but I think it's because they're actually more critical either of James Cameron or the fact that the story was relatively easy. But the look of it, it was just, you just couldn't fault it. So, and the, uh, the other thing with um, Avatar is that in 3D, uh, it looked fantastic, and I think there's never been any other sort of 3D movie that's been able to top it. So that was one of the sort of real draws towards people. Go for an NPS. I was going to say, I, I didn't 
agree. I don't agree with your comments only because I don't find the film that interesting at all. You know, the colors are nice, but it's it's just a nothing film. You know, right. apart from the fact that the tails are used to connect with the horses and that sort of thing. Other than that, to me, it's just a meh film. I can take it or leave it. Okay. Although, but fair enough. Although on the counter argument, you're saying, well, the thing was the highest grossing movie in the planet. Why? It must have been a reason. It couldn't just be because yeah. it had Sigourney Weaver in it. So I don't want to make a discussion of an avatar, but there's got to be a reason why something is successful. And I think it's because of its visual style. And I agree with uh, Jeffro. The 3D worked extremely well. So, um, yeah. But how are we measuring success? Are we measuring it by money or are we measuring it by popularity? So yeah, not, in this case, the money, yeah, but the money comes from the cinema ticket sales and mm -hmm. people who would just go back for repeat viewing. I mean, it was. It was the biggest selling film in the entire movie of the world, beat Titanic, which James Cameron made. And it's like, well, that's just no mean feat. And uh, but that the question is, and I don't want to make it as a discussion, why? And the reason why, right, is because of the fact of the way it looked. And I think that's personally why it was such a success, because everybody's saying to everybody else, you've got to go and see Avatar. It's absolutely outstanding, purely regardless of whether you like the story or not. So that's what I think it, um, is what sold it. On a completely different note, uh, I agree completely with, with what Daniel said here. Alien works because you don't see the alien, which I think is absolutely ingenious. It's the dark, it's the moody, it's the, like the atmospheric thing, it's the horror story, but you don't really get to see the bad guy. And um, that's actually very interesting. So it's a classic example of where showing as little as possible of your baddie actually makes the movie work. And I think that's actually a very, very uh, interesting observation. So uh, one, uh, well done, Daniel. By contrary, I think Aliens works because of the military thing, right? If you took all the military out, the Colonial Marines, took them all out together, there's no Colonial, Mar Colonial Marines, it's like Alien 3, right? There's no guns, there's no shooting, there's no grouse um, commentary between the characters and, and the wonderful dialogue, right? The film would have been shit, right? But it succeeds so well purely because of the colonial marines, okay? Your Hudson and your Hicks and your Vazquez and all those dudes and all the, the way they interact with each other, get the gear on with the, with the armour and the smart guns, that sold it. And, uh, and it was such a nice contrast to the original movie. And I think it's a lot of people would hook into that more than anything else. It's not because, oh, what does LV-426 look like? Who cares? What about the Sulaco? Don't really care about that either. What about Gorney's character, which was, a you know, she, they did a wonderful thing with her, but it was the look and the involvement of the Colonial Marines, I think, that had a lot to do with it. So uh, that's what I think. Actually, actually, going back to your previous comment about uh, uh, a movie really does have to grab you in the first 10 minutes, the interesting thing about Alien, there isn't actually anything that happens in the first 10 minutes. Yeah. Much You're less right. about thirty minutes. So um, yeah, it's good, good, good uh, one that doesn't fit into the um, into the into the, the situation there. Yeah, exactly right. Um, another couple of examples that I just wanted to bring up that uh, this I can remember this vividly. Uh, Cloverfield, right? I saw the film Cloverfield, and I was so invested in the characters at the start. Um, with the relationship problem between the main character and the girlfriend and the brother and all the rest, I completely forgot it was a monster movie. And the reason why I got invested in it is because I'd never seen the actors before, ever. I didn't know who they were. To me, I was just completely sucked in. Now, whether you've seen Cloverfield or haven't seen it, don't remember it, whatever else, you're actually, like, really dialed into this particular situation with this um, relationship issue, and then something happens in the city, you know, there's a massive explosion, and you go, oh, shit, that's right, this is a monster movie. And that, for me, I was that was my first 10 minutes, right? Bang, I was in and sold. And um, the way the monster is presented, the fact that it looks really scary and it's from the point of view of the characters, I, I said, yep, that's I'm done. I'm, I'm completely sold into this. It's not done as a normal Hollywood film, in my opinion. And, uh, and for that reason, when I see something, I go, you know what, that really, really works for me. Cloverfield was an example of a film that was massively, brilliantly done purely because I didn't know who the cast were. So I don't know if either you two think the same way. I sort of vaguely remember the movie. I thought it was very clever that they did it from a, a point of view style. Um, the, the monster sort of reminded me a bit of Godzilla, but uh, that's about all I remember about it. Another yeah, example. I'm sorry, Gal, you go first. I was going to say it was the same thing. It was like a, a, it was like a almost Godzilla film that you wanted. You know, you didn't know what the monster looked like and all that sort of stuff. As for the actors in it, there was a couple that were familiar. There was the um, 
one of the guys from Scrubs. So if you ever saw Scrubs, you knew him. And I think one of the girls was from something else that I can't remember off the top of my head. See, some movies can do something different and that can really work for you. District 9 was one I just thought of just then because it starts off as a documentary. And the fact that the aliens land over the top of Johannesburg and not in um, New York. And they even say that in the show. It's like normally these things land in America somewhere and it ends up over the top of Johannesburg. And it starts off as a documentary, then moves into a drama. Um, that was very easy to get sucked into because you believe that actually happened. You think, well, to the best of my knowledge, there is an alien ship over Johannesburg because it actually dialed you in that way. It was something you knew, something different, uh, unique. And, um, uh, it, and it worked in the context of the, of the entire story. And the whole thing was actually quite believable. I think that's actually um, uh, one of the reasons why District 9 was so well regarded. Uh, very, very cool. There's a few people talking about Cloverfield, actually, which is kind of grimy. Um, yeah, you're right, Colin. Uh, yeah, the found footage thing sometimes doesn't work. It started with Blair Witch Project, but the camera's shaking around. Don't see it in the cinema. Totally agree with you on that one. Um, so, yes, and I think they may have even had, like, bath bags or something handed out uh, through the production as well. And there's only one other one that I wanted to bring up, uh, which uh, completely sold me. Once again, the first 10 minutes, done. I'm hooked. V for Vendetta. Um, and what I saw that in the cinema, and I didn't know anything about it. It just looked interesting, and I was... 10 minutes, done. I'm invested. And the reason why I loved it so much and was invested in it, I loved the way the world was built, where they said, okay, America is now out of the picture. They're not the big economic superpower they once were. England now is. And there's all this stuff going on with the dicto dictatorial government and the way it was explained, the way it was brought in to the story. And I found that that pushed all my buttons. And I thought, you know what? The way it's been presented has been so well done. And, of course, with the introduction of V, the character, the, they, the fact that they don't show his um, face at the end, they don't take his mask off or anything like that, it just was really, really well put together. And that's the thing that really dialed into my interest. It was something unique and something different. And um, for those who've never seen V for Vendetta, they're missing out on something really spectacular. So. I, yeah, I tend to think the big advantage of V for Vendetta is the fact that it's based off of a comic book. And with the comic writers, they do put a lot of background into the, the, the whole thing. So the actual movie people are able to draw upon that and bring out all the best elements. So mm. the fact that uh, it, it has come from a comic book source, I think, makes the movie a lot richer. Cool. Well, it didn't work for Michelle, apparently. So that's OK. It doesn't work for everybody. That's fair enough. But uh, uh, it is good when you see something that you think, oh, I didn't see that one coming. And that's actually worked uh, really, really well. Because there's a whole lot of movies you can think of that don't work for you. I mean, I'm thinking of Ender's Game. I remember seeing Ender's Game. And it was like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, it comes, no, goes. I yeah. Mind. yeah, but I wouldn't class it as like it's memorable. It's like oh, it's in my top 10 of like all the greatest mm -hmm. movies of all time. There's a, It could be through a whole lot of particular reasons. And um, but there are always some that don't seem to work for you. Yeah, MPS. What's really funny is over the last couple of weeks, I've been on Netflix and Prime and, and watching a few sci-fi films just for the sake because I haven't seen them and they're all new. One of them was Gemini. It's the Will Smith film, you yeah. know, where he fights himself. Um, the Beyond, uh, Dominion, The Last Star uh, Warrior, and The Lost Man. And you know what? I can't remember a single thing about any of those films. And yet, I only watched them a week or two ago. That's how this. Um, what's the word for it? There's, there's that, that factor that is the. There's nothing there. You know, I watched it. I never have to watch it again. That leads directly into this comment from Aaron about saying everybody remembers the characters and the cast from Aliens, but Alien Cubed, it's like nothing. It was like who was in it? John, I know Charles Dance was in it. Who did he play? No idea. Okay, does anybody even care? And. Uh, that's a very good example of that. And I think it all comes down to the fact that with, say, Alien 3 and Alien Resurrection, there was nothing there for the audience to hook into that there was for the previous two movies. So it does, does goes to show that it's a lot more to it than just saying the franchise is strong enough to support sequel films. There's got to be uh, still got to be a strong hook for the audience to deal into. And it's very, very difficult for a movie to get become successful when it's just a one-off. I mean, E.T., what worked? E.T., right? Now, if E.T., had have been a completely different design, completely different personality, right? Didn't do the phone home, didn't do the thing with the finger. It looked different. It would have, it, it may not have been anywhere near as successful as the version that we had, right? When you see an ET doll, you go, that's a freaking butt ugly thing. But when you see it in the movie, it has life. It's the one thing, it's a bit like Snake Plissken, it's the one thing that makes the whole thing gel together. And everything hinges on the success of how the alien is portrayed. Because when you first see the movie, you got no idea whether he's going to speak normally 
going to be an attitude problem. He's going to just do this, do that. And it just fits in because it fit the cute thing so well. And um, that is uh, a good example of where good planning, good design, and a good concept can be immensely successful. Because based on the story, the story is very obvious. It's like an alien gets left on Earth. Big deal. So there you go. MPS. I was going to say, I think what makes a good film for most of us, because we know most of our audience as well, is how many times you watch it. You know, how many times you watch it on TV, even though you have the DVDs, you know, or Blu-rays or whatever the case is, you know. I don't know how many times I've seen True Lies, and it is one of my all-time favourite films, and I will put it on every single time on TV. And yet, I've got a copy of it here. But, you know, it's it's just that watchable fact that there's... It's a spy thing, and there's nothing brilliant about it. It's not James Bond, it's not... But it has something different. But you always just want to watch that scene. Oh, hang on, I'll, I'll go and make a copy. No, I want to watch that scene. Hang on, I want to, and that's what it's about. I think we we tend to love these films and these things, and we'll watch them any time of the day. Good old Michelle's writing a fibby tonight, so it's weird. Sometimes I watch the actor, sometimes the writer, sometimes the world. You're right, uh, Michelle. Sometimes you're watching movies for different things and different things. Uh, something about it. yeah, Ready Player One is a bit of a gimme because of the all the pop culture references. Take those out, and you'd have no movie, okay? because you can identify with Ready Player One. Everybody goes, oh, look for the Batmobile, look for this thing, look for that. That's the reason why everybody just got sucked into it, right? And people didn't even twig or didn't even acknowledge the fact that it's actually a very depressing movie. The whole world building in the real world is very, very, you know, dystopian. People just think of all the flash and dazzle of the virtual world. So I found that quite interesting. So, um, so yeah, right. Okay, Carol, just... For the hell of a calamity jane yeah okay <laughs> let's just i'm working on the assumption it's because of calamity jane the character so yes there are examples where a single character can make the whole thing work and even if you go back into the old sci-fi things a flying saucer is a flying saucer right so what's the big deal so why is the day the earth is still a better movie than say zontar the thing from venus it's because of the characterization of klaatu uh who comes to earth you know he wants to tell everybody what's going on Gore plays his part, but Klaatu is the key thing. People dial into it and go, you know what? We're used to seeing aliens being horrible and, and terrible to people. He's actually a, a very benevolent um, character. And, and, of course, the actual world uh, that features in Altair, in um, Forbidden Planet, I think a lot of people sort of uh, relate to that. So, hey, hey, hey. so there you go. How good is that? There's a few bit to chew through. Now, I don't know if we've answered Michelle's question or not, and it's a, it, it's, we've obviously run out of time, actually, well and truly run out of time. Um, but hopefully we've sort of touched on a little bit. MPS, you want to say something? I was going to say one other thing. When you watch something like um, Robocop or Total Recall, you've got the older original version that we know, and then you've got the newer version. I always tend to go back to the original because mm -hmm. even though the newer version have good bits to it, the older version for some reason just work much better. I don't know if it's because we know them so well or if it's just because they're a better film uh, for the age. Um, there's a comment from Aaron. Uh, yeah, we could have a long, long, long discussion of being forced to see things that we just can't stand. So uh, I feel... For when I saw Twilight, I thought, oh, I did you my Twilight Zone movie? And that Twilight movie, all right, I'll get you, I feel your pain, son. So uh, there you go. Jeffrey, anything you want to say, man? Um, I've never seen any Twilight Zone movies, so my wife's uh, very good to me. It's Twilight movie, not Twilight Zone movies, you idiot. Oh, whatever it is, yeah. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> But uh, the good news is I think generally um, successful movies are successful for a reason and there could be a lot of, like, studies done as to why they're successful. What's the actual trigger that people say, you know what, I'm watching it just for that. And uh, and those that don't work, clearly whoever's made them or whoever's put them together needs to look at it and go, yeah, okay, what are we missing? What has made our movie different to this other movie, especially if they're set in space and whatever else? Uh, and I think there's there's something in that. So, yeah, P.S., you want to say something, man? Yeah, I mean, uh, I tend to think the directors of Sorry. No, you you go, oh, whatever. Yeah, I was going to say the directors, I think, are the ones that uh, really are the, the people that make and break it. A lot of the movies that we've said, oh, these are really fantastic. Uh, you're picking um, Alien and Aliens, Ridley Scott, you know, um, James Cameron, uh, director number th three. Who can remember who directed Aliens 3? So uh, as I said a lot of the examples... We've got really creative people doing them. Neil Blondekamp for uh, District 9. So I think the directors are a, a real key factor. Very good. MPS? I've actually forgot what I was going to say. 
<laughs> I like this one from Calvin. Like Jeffro is Jeff not in the zone. I like that. Very good. Yep. I, I know what it was. Um, so these are all the films that we love and all that sort of stuff. But what's popular that you don't like? Like there's got to be a film. Like for me, it's it's um, like Spaceballs. It's one of those films. Oh, I just I've seen it. I love all the jokes. Don't get me wrong. But you know what? I don't have to ever see it again. And yet everybody else loves it. So you know, I it's I, there have got to be other films that you guys like that are, are quite popular, quite big, but just yeah. Blade yeah, Runner. Absolutely. Blade Runner. I think we may have to save that for another chat because we're rolling truly over time. Um, and even though we got eighteen people, I'm not. I'm keen to keep going, but I don't know how much longer to keep going for before we start overstaying our welcome. But I think to answer your question, yes, there would be things that you love that aren't like Jeffrey talked about Buckaroo Bonsai that aren't necessarily massively popular. And go well. If they, they're not mass, massively popular, what is it about them that you appeals to you? Um, and I'm conscious of the fact we've still got 17 people watching. Um, I've loved these top. Oh, there you go. Oh, there you go. We've got. Oh, there you go, Michelle. We hopefully got this. We've got this right, which is good. This is the most important thing. Uh, and yeah, I think if we start opening this can of worms, we'll actually end up going a bit further, even though we're sort of been on a bit of a roll. Um, unless you want to. Well, it is raining outside, so we've still got, as I said, 17 people watching. Did you want to bring up an example of what you were talking about? Because I know I've got one. Well, as I was saying, you know, um, Spaceballs is one of those films that never, it, it, it didn't, I didn't like it, obviously, because it was a mock of Star Wars and that sort of thing. Um, but everyone else seems to love it. And, you know, there are obviously others, but uh, what's your example? My example is Dune. Um, now, we're talking about the 1984 version of Dune. I adore the film absolutely adore it. and i know i'm in the minority and i've got no problem with that at all there are people on this show who can't stand it don't like it don't understand it fair enough i've got no issue with it right but it worked for me once i understood the story i love the world building and i love the idea of how the characters integrated with each other and the fact that it wasn't a simple story it was very convoluted very difficult very political and it pushed a lot of my buttons the design of it all was really really great and uh, i found that it worked on my level and I got something out of it because I don't like cookie cutter stories as a general rule. I don't like the idea that boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl at the end. I like something a little bit more thought provoking. And um, yeah, and that was just something that since then, since 1985 or six, when I finally read the book, it's just, it's just one of those things that works on for me. And even if no one else in the world likes it, I certainly do. So um, that was my uh, example. Yeah. And it became not just a viewer, I came quite invested in it, you know, knowing characters and the stories and the and and all the other bits and pieces that went with it as well. So, uh, Jeffro, do you want to say something, mate? Yeah, my my example of a movie that I absolutely loved and the rest of the world didn't seem to love at all uh, was Predators. So when the Shane Black movie came out about a year and a half ago, it just tanked big time at the box office. Uh, nobody loved it. All the reviews are bad, and I thought it was the best Predator movie ever. And then sort of not long after that, so we saw a, uh, a a movie that I just said, this is absolutely fantastic. This, this is my movie of the year. It was a movie called Mortal Engines, and it made it made about $40 million on a budget of $200 million. So, um, you know, it's, it's like, why am I liking this and everyone else isn't getting it? I have no idea. Another situation that occurs is where a movie comes out and it is shit canned from the outset, and there's an example of this too, but then t two decades later it finds an audience, right, and people start to really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So they didn't appreciate it at the time, but then time goes past, and if anything, the film gets a greater appreciation than the other films that it was competing against. And the best example of that is John Carpenter's The Thing. So The Thing came out in 1982, the same year as E.T., right? Absolutely got slammed like you wouldn't believe because you've got E.T., which is the happy alien, you've got the thing, which is this gruesome, gory movie, and it actually got lambasted really badly. The one that clocked forward two decades later, well, there's Thing fans that have just come out of the woodwork and they go, you know what, we absolutely love the movie and it's found a brand new audience. And I guess this is where the cult movie thing comes into it. So you can actually ask yourself, well, how come something wasn't appreciated at the time but then found an audience many, many years later? And I guess that's sort of maybe people weren't, it, it was a shock factor for something when it first came out. But when the dust has settled uh, and the competition has long gone away and people's attitudes have changed, that they suddenly realise, 
actually it wasn't as bad as I first thought or as I remember it. So uh, I don't know if you can think of examples like that. I think probably for me it's a lot of the movies that seem to do very well on uh, videotape that didn't do well so well in the box office. So I, I think this is where you get the cult followings that, that build up. So um, you've got things like um, uh, They Live, using another John Carpenter mm. uh, example. Uh, it it didn't do well in the cinemas, but, you know, it found its fame on uh, videotape and, and, and has an audience. Tremors, I think, was the same thing. That's got a huge cult following based on, a, a set of, uh, people that saw it on video. And I think for a lot of these examples, those people that saw the thing in the cinemas probably aren't the people that love it now. So the people who love it now are probably about 10 years younger from those people that are seeing it in the, uh, the cinemas back then. So, you know, when they say a movie's ahead of its time, uh, that's probably a good example of it. Some good comments here from... So, MPS, you want to say something before I click some of these? I was going to say, I, I can't remember how much these two made, but uh, for me, I didn't love The Matrix or The Mummy back in the day. They both came out. They were... I thought the mummy was been, meant to be more, less comedy, more sort of dramatic, you know. And the Matrix, I just didn't know what to make of it. And it wasn't until a few years later that I watched them again on DVD, and that's where the love for those films came from. So, yeah, maybe it was just the first viewing. You know, when you see something for the first time, you either you love it or you hate it. And sometimes you get the second viewing, and it changes your mind. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, here's a comment from Dave. Totally agree with you, uh, Dave. It is uh, films work on different ways for different people. The biggest, huge budgeted movies don't necessarily work in terms of getting the right audience. Some people just don't like them. And sometimes it's small independent movies that can just really work for you. So it's actually uh, uh, a very valid point there. Absolutely. Um, I like this one from Aaron as well, that, uh, yes, there's things even from your childhood and from wherever else that people can say, yes, I do remember this, and it just planted a seed in my head effectively. And regardless of what the world thinks of it today, it still um, uh, works for you on your own level. I guess the only risk, of course, is when you see something in a period of your life and you really dial into it and then you watch it again 40 years later and you go, shit, it was not as good as I remember it. So uh, that's always a risk. TV shows are a bit like that, especially cartoons. Um so matured totally agree with you michelle on this one audiences have matured and of course the biggest problem you've got now is that it's very hard to be original now uh a lot of things come out and you go oh, i've seen this before in this movie here this movie here it's a remake of this a remake of that whereas once upon a time everything came out the first time it was just it was like wow this is the first appearance of this and uh and that's when it's really unique and spectacular but when it gets repeated multiple times over the generations then you start going oh yeah it just reminds me of all these other products so it's actually a lot harder to be impressed these days i think in a lot of ways a good example of that um came from um like even in star wars uh, the phantom menace when they had coruscant with all the buildings everywhere and all the ships are flying around and again that's meant to look fantastic but we saw it three years earlier in the fifth element so the the moment's already already gone um Tremors of the cinema. Uh, where are we? I think the center of a fair. I agree with you, Michelle. Mich I didn't want to bring this up, but now that you brought it up, sound. Uh, one of the things that makes the cheap ass rip off movies cheap and rippy arsey offery, that's bad English, is the sound. And I'll give you the best example of that is that in Star Wars, when they shoot the guns, the laser guns sound awesome. The worst thing is when you get the cheap ass the Italian rip offs and it's piao, piao, piao. Wee wee, and or sound is critical. The sound of ships, the sound of weapons, the sound of your characters, the sound of the world. It works on a very, very subconscious level, and a lot of people don't even realize it uh, until they discuss it. So, what makes a lightsaber work? Is it because it's a laser beam? No, it's the sound it makes when it's activated and is swinging around. And you might say, Well, I don't really notice it, it doesn't really bother me. But when they change it for future movies, then you notice it. And then you can mm -hmm. say, oh, yes, actually, the sound actually was quite critical. MPS, you're going to say something? There's that one scene in the new Trek films where oh, I think it was the original Trek 2009 where something happens and they're blown into space and it just goes dead silent. And it is like the best scene because there's nothing. There's no hissing or space or people yelling. It's just dead silence for that you know minute or whatever the case is while you hear 
what happens in space. And that sound quality, the sound construction is, is phenomenal. Yeah, that's a good example when sound is removed, especially from space scenes. People do notice it. It's kind of funny. Subconsciously, you're used to hearing rocket ships and all the noises mm -hmm. in space, but when they're not there, and you go, what's missing? And you go, oh, actually, that actually kind of works. So, um, yeah. It's like with The Last Jedi where they actually have to tell audiences that there's deliberately not going to be a piece of sound. Yeah, yeah, exactly <laughs> right. So there you go. Um, so there's a lot of good stuff here. But, look, I think it's a conversation that could uh, continue on for – quite some time and I am conscious of the fact that we're like 25 minutes over time so we kind of have gurgled on a bit here so I do apologize for that very good all right so uh anyway we're going to buzz off we're, we're covered off a lot, a lot of stuff tonight sorry for all the messages that we did miss but uh in the interim make sure you uh get out and about because you can now because it's uh you know the curfew's all gone and uh in the interim make sure you of course stay nerdy okay see you next time next week okay see ya